Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome back if you're joining us again, okay? Um, so if you're new here, what we're doing is going through our ECG coding reference guide, which we have available online and in print form. And if you don't have access yet, okay, or if you do, all you have to do is go to this link here, okay? It's on our website, www.ekg.md. Okay, here's the URL if you want to simply put that in. Okay, as we're making some current updates to our site to make give you guys more resources. Um, and what you will do is put your email address in, click submit. Okay, if you're a first time user, you'll get an email. From your email, you'll click a link to confirm your email and then you'll have access. Okay, now if you're a return user, all you do is put your email in, submit, and then you'll get, have access, okay? So this is only the first time users where you have to confirm that. Now, what you want to do is um, once you are have the, the reference guide opened, okay? Click on this first section and we're looking at the general features and P-wave abnormalities. And here we're gonna first look at right atrial enlargement. So if you're wondering where are the lectures for the previous, just look back and they're all available. All right, so let's get started. So first we're gonna look at right atrial enlargement or abnormality, okay? And this is a finding that is associated with many conditions. And what we wanna do here is be able to recognize it on the EKG. So what you want to do is you want to focus on a few leads, okay? And these are the leads we focus on when looking for um, atrial abnormalities, mainly the lead two and V1. And when we're looking for atrial abnormalities, we focus on the P wave. Okay, the P wave is the first complex. This one here, here's our QRS and T wave, is where we look for atrial abnormalities. Specifically, we're looking for atrial enlargement. Okay, is the right atrium enlarged? Okay, remember the heart has four chambers. This is your right atrium, your left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. And when we're looking for enlargement, we're looking is this area enlarged okay for right atrial enlargement so what you want to do is we said lead two is the best one as well as lead v1 okay you can also look at these other inferior leads in lead two so in the inferior leads which is two three and avf you want to see a p wave amplitude that is greater than 2.5 okay so what does that mean well imagine that we have our normal p wave here this is what we're talking about. The amplitude of this is greater than 2.5 millimeters, okay? And this is in leads two, three, and AVF, okay? So if you look here, maybe hard to tell, but these P waves are pointed and they actually do go beyond it. So if you look down here at the rhythm strip, if you were to measure it out, close to 2.5 or three, all right, in meeting that. This patient actually did have right atrial enlargement. Um, the other thing is this is called P pulmonale, okay? And P pulmonale, you can think of the P, okay, for peaked P waves, okay, that's going on here. Uh, some people call them Himalayans or the tall P waves. And these P waves, the P you can think of in pulmonale is it's often associated with lung conditions. So lung conditions is where you tend to see this. And we'll look at some associated conditions. You'll see how a lot of them tend to affect the right of the heart and often contributed from the lung. So the other lead you can look at is lead V1 or V2, okay? And you're looking at the initial portion. Here's our P wave. And remember, you can see biphasic P waves in leads V1 and V2, so biphasic like this. Okay, so V1, V2, this criteria, and here you're looking at the P wave of the initial P wave, okay? And what do I mean by that? The initial portion is this one, and this is the terminal, okay? So the initial actually represents the right atrial depolarizing, and the second portion, left atrium depolarizing, so RA. And what you want is the amplitude of this to be at least... 1.5 millimeters okay so again normal p waves can look like these two here okay 
these would be normal. If you start to get any heightening of that, where it's beyond 1.5 in those right precordial leads, that may suggest right atrial enlargement. Now, I do want to make an important point. These conditions, these two that um, are now we're suggesting represent right atrial enlargement, have to have sinus rhythm in place. So when they initially developed the criteria, it was suggested and expected, presumed that the patient was in sinus rhythm, meaning that the rhythm was originating from the sinus node in the right atrium. And that's why you tend to see the peaking or the initial portion of the P wave because the right atrium is depolarized before this left atrium. Okay, in the terminal portion, this left atrium, you tend to see it going a depth, an increase in depth, and an increase in width. And when you look at it in the inferior leads, you tend to see an increase um, in the width as well as some notching. So we'll look at left atrial enlargement in an upcoming lecture, but this is kind of the principle behind it. So sinus rhythm, it presumes sinus rhythm is present when you're applying these criteria. Now some associated conditions include chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. Okay, and so why is that the case? Well, we know that, let's just erase this here. This is a lung condition, okay? We often see with our smokers that tend to have this. And what's happening so if we just redraw our heart, this is our right atrium. You know that blood flows to the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, it goes out to the lungs. Okay, and so if you can imagine if there's lung damage, whether there's a clot or the parenchyma is damaged and it's causing increased resistance, that resistance then backs up into the right side of the heart and from the right ventricle into the right atrium. So you may have RV strain, right ventricular strain, and you have right atrial enlargement. And so it's pretty much a backup of pressure. And that's what COPD can do. Congenital heart disease, such as Tetralogy of Fallot, uh, pulmonic stenosis. Remember the pulmonary valve is here. If it's stenotic, that means the pressure will back up. Tricuspid atresia, uh, Eisenmanger's uh, physiology. So all of these we discuss in our course, which we go into more detail there. A pulmonary embolism can also cause it. Imagine if you have an embolus sitting here in one of the main branches of the pulmonary artery. You can have RV strain, okay, may have a leak in the troponin, the enzyme from the heart, and even eventually right atrial enlargement can ensue. So um, it could be a normal variant, okay, if someone has a small body uh, habitus, they have a vertical positioned heart, or it may be even secondary, at least 30% are actually from left atrial enlargement. So the left atrium enlarging, and as a result, causing a back pressure on the lungs, that back up into the right side of the heart, okay? So, and when you're seeing the right atrial enlargement, also look for left atrial enlargement. So a few things to note. So again, right atrial enlargement, presuming sinus rhythm is in, is in place, and then you can apply these criteria. The best leads I look at are lead two and V1, okay? And those are the leads and the inferior leads. You're looking for at least 2.5 or uh, millimeters in amplitude, okay? And then in lead V1, 1.5. So hopefully that makes sense. You can think of one way to think of this, how I remember it, is in lead 2, it's the 2.5. In lead V1, okay, it's 1.5, okay, because it's sometimes hard to remember those numbers. So the 2 and 2.5, the 1 and 1.5, okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter. Okay, so completely separate from what you're getting online for free. Okay, these are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book Okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide.
uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use the, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there, very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic and editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay. You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay, and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right, have a great day.